Our purpose in this life is a precious gift. This gift is often waiting to be unearthed in the why of what we do and believe. Our purpose is found in the why of protecting what matters most. Another nation has launched several missiles this week in what they are calling a training exercise. The U.S. military warns Space that Force is using next-generation detection satellites to detect and track missile launches. The U.S. missile defense system proved valiant today. It was able to take out several targets simultaneously in a test scenario. The National Weather Service has issued a severe tornado warning for the surrounding counties. Meteorologists, geostationary lightning mapper, and Doppler radar are tracking a large storm system. The town of Newcastle, Oklahoma, is giving credit to an early warning severe weather forecast system for saving countless lives before a mile-wide tornado hit the town. ISS, Houston, over. Go ahead, Houston. We've just received an early warning from the Space Weather Prediction Center that their solar ultraviolet imager on GO-16 is observing an X-class flare and is now forecasting a major S-4 solar radiation storm. We're canceling today's spacewalk. I need all the crew to take appropriate cover in the laboratory immediately. We interrupt this regularly scheduled broadcast. NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center has just released a warning of a major solar storm that may cause massive power outages across the Florida coast. Our purpose is found in the why of connecting to each other, around town and around the world. And the U.S. Space Force continues to modernize today's GPS satellite constellation with new, more powerful GPS-3 satellites that will help make secure, tougher-to-jam and spoof M-code signals available to our military forces around the world. Sector, this is Roanek. We are in position on scene and navigating to the ship's distress signal. Stand by for medevac. Sir, our satellite alerted us to an avalanche. It's imaging the area and tracking heat signatures of potential victims. Sending updates now. The State Department has stated hackers tried to attack U.S. satellites today, but failed due to artificial intelligence that actively defends and heals from cyber attacks. Today, at the United Nations, the World Carbon Alliance shared GeoCap satellite data that shows carbon emissions rising over the East Coast. We are the target beta. Be advised, we are taking small arms fire and danger close to the drop. Sending our exact coordinates. Over. General, this is Air Force One. We will be connecting you to a secure line to the President shortly. Stand by, One. And our purpose is found in the why of exploring what lies beyond. Insight has passed through peak deceleration. Altitude convergence, lander separation commanded. Altitude 600 meters. Altitude 400 meters. 200 meters. 80 meters. 60 meters. 30 meters. 17 meters. Standing by for touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. <laughs> NASA's InSight lander has measured the first ever Mars quake inside the red planet. OSIRIS-REx is one step closer to completing a daring mission to survey and collect a sample from the asteroid Bennu. Scientists are hoping to discover insight into the origin of our solar system. Our why inspires us to protect, connect, and explore today and for generations to come. It's really something else. I can't believe we're here. Unearthed long ago, the why is what gives us our purpose, a mission to advance the human race into the dawn of a new space age. Mars Base Camp, this is Lunar Control. You are a go. You're cleared to proceed to Mars. Go make history.
Hey SEDS fam, I'm Will Pomerantz. I'm a proud SEDS alum and for about a decade I've had the honor of being the chair of your board of advisors and a trustee. Uh, I love coming to Space Vision, even virtual Space Vision, because it's a wonderful opportunity for me to meet you all and for us as an industry to really teach you all as students about the cool opportunities that are out there for you to have fantastic careers in aerospace. Today I want to introduce you a little bit to some of my teammates here at Virgin Orbit. We are a company that is doing amazing things. I would love to have you join us. If you love airplanes and rockets and satellites, we might be a fantastic place for you. If you really want to join a team that takes on some of the hardest challenges with some of the best resources and an incredible team, learn about our internships. I hope that you'll apply. And now I'll hand it over to my amazing colleagues to tell you more. Hello, everyone. Thank you for stopping by our virtual booth. Um, if you don't already know me, my name is Alyssa Morrison. I'm one of the recruiters here with Virgin Orbit, and I'm here to chat with you about the recruiting process for our internship program. Um, first and foremost, please apply online. You can find the job application listed on our careers page of our website. We're offering 15 different positions this for next summer, and uh, those range from engineering related roles to non-engineering related roles. If selected to move forward, you will be contacted by me directly. And because we live with this new world with COVID, all of our interviews will be taking place over the phone. So no need to come in the office. This is a 12 week long program and it has the opportunity to get extended beyond that. It is a paid internship as well. And if you're not from the area, we do provide housing as well. So I can chat with you about that in further detail if selected. I think that's it for now. So definitely hang tight. Our deadline to apply is Friday, November 13th, so get it in ASAP. And like I said, if selected to move forward, I'll be the one reaching out to you. Thank you for stopping by our virtual booth. And now let's hear from some of our teammates. Hello everyone, my name is Olshan Taiwo. I'm an engineer on the Advanced Propulsion Manufacturing Team. Uh, I work primarily as an additive manufacturing engineer, so using the latest 3D printing technology and techniques in order to be able to produce components for our uh, Launcher One program. Um, I absolutely love working here due to the fact that we work on so many crazy projects that are only happening here at BO. It's such a unique um, challenge, right, to be able to tackle some of these things, but then also the fact that we have such amazing resources to grow, not only uh, as a program, but also in our careers as young engineers. I um, absolutely love it. You can only do that here at Virgin Orbit, so awesomeness. Uh, I hope everyone is doing awesome, and I hope to see some of you guys work here with us. Cheers. Hi everyone, my name is Asusena Jimenez and I am a Propulsion Components Test Engineer here at Virgin Orbit. I was actually part of the SETS chapter who held the 2018 Space Vision Conference and that is the first time that I got the chance to talk to um, and meet people from Virgin Orbit and luckily in 2019 I was able to come back as a Propulsion Engineering intern um, where I worked on actual components that went on to the first rocket that we launched back in early this year. It's a very passionate and very involved company. Um, every day here is fast paced, which presents an awesome learning opportunity, especially for interns. Hi everyone, my name is Kayla Simon. I'm a propulsion test engineer at Virgin Orbit over here at our Mojave test site. Um, my job kind of consists of two parts, so one being system upgrades to our lovely test stand that you see here, and then also test operations where I work mostly on our first stage engine, Newton 3. Um, I like that I'm able to walk outside and go see a rocket engine. I think that's been the most effective way to learn for me. Um, I also love that I met some of my best friends through working here. I was an intern first back almost two and a half years ago in the summer of 2018, and I knew that I wanted to start full time um, and that I'd be surrounded by people who were smart and innovative and fun. Um, so even when it's over 100 degrees outside, which it is very frequently, <laughs> I'm still happy to work with such a great team to do some amazing work. Hi, my name is Monica Gangor. I am the Senior Program Manager here at Virgin Orbit. I also am in charge of the wonderful intern program. Our interns get to work on real flight hardware as well as other amazing projects. We want to make sure that all of our interns get great development while they're interning and so we partner every intern up with a mentor and you get to really create a magical relationship with your mentor. You get a lot of development from that. and. These are going to be long lasting relationships, not just with your mentors and your teammates, but also with your intern cohorts. Don't worry, it's not all work. We have a ton of fun things planned for all of you, like going to the beach and barbecuing with our CEO and visiting other Virgin companies like Virgin Hyperloop. 
I look forward to having more conversations with you and have a wonderful time at the conference. I'm audience for now. Hi, Jim Green here. Can you hear me? Yeah, this is Jim Pass. Okay, Jim. I'm in the next se session, but I, I'm just audience for now. Ah, okay. Yeah, so I'm just checking everything I can check to be ready. Hi, Dr. Green, we can hear you. Yes, good, good, good. Good morning. Uh, we have good a morning. video we're going to play, and then we'll hand it off to you. OK. Good morning and welcome to Space Vision 2020. My name is Libby Lloyd, your SEDS USA Executive Director, and it is my honor to welcome you to the first and hopefully last virtual Space Vision, hosted by SEDS University of North Texas in conjunction with SEDS USA and sponsored by our friends at Lockheed Martin Space. We are so excited and thankful to have you here this morning. While this conference looks a lot different than what we originally imagined, we are so very grateful to be able to have an incredible lineup of speakers and panelists spanning all sectors of the space industry and representing a diverse set of backgrounds. The COVID-19 pandemic has offered us a unique opportunity to reevaluate the way we socialize, work, and attend university. While many of our operations at SEDS USA were already virtual, the way the chapters have interacted and conducted projects and chapter activities has drastically changed. We, however, are happy to report that there have been no significant changes in chapter engagement and involvement. We have seen the chapters adapt and flourish in this virtual environment by increasing virtual engagements, such as starting book clubs, SEDS Minecraft servers, and successfully hosting general chapter meetings through Zoom and other video conferencing tools. This year's theme is Beyond Earth, Humanity as an Interplanetary Species. When first coming up with our theme, we wanted to incorporate a truly multidisciplinary approach to identify where the next generation of space is headed. Whether it be our growth in space technology, from the latest achievements seen by novel payloads from around the world to even new launch vehicles in China, all the way to the fields of space policy as new policies and international relationships begin forming. We are proud to state that the future of space is an enigma we have yet to solve. Having the goal of humans becoming an interplanetary species is an ambitious goal. We are the faces of future leaders making this a reality and it is our job to make sure our goals are limitless and create the momentum vector to drive us forward in all aspects. For the duration of the conference, we also will be hosting a virtual career fair. Don't forget to head over to the Career Fair Plus app to learn more about the upcoming employment opportunities with some of our sponsors and partners. We have opportunities ranging from full-time, part-time, internships, and volunteer roles. Please know our, our companies involved are not only seeking technical backgrounds, but any and all enthusiasts that are willing to find their place in space. Examples include policy, science communication, and business, and some positions are even accepting international students. And without further ado, I now present to you your opening Space Vision 2020 keynote speaker, Dr. James Green, Chief Scientist of NASA. Good morning, Dr. Green. Thanks for being here with us today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to an exciting opportunity to talk with everyone and, and, and really let's, let's explore space. So uh, let me uh, start by sharing my screen. All right, good, good, good. And um, before I start, let me ask, can everyone see my screen? I'm yep. hoping that answer is yes. 
Jim, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, so let's get going. All right, today I want to talk about science and exploration concentrating on the moon and Mars. All right, and to do that, uh, uh, let's go back to the last effort, the Apollo program for humans to walk on the surface of the moon. So here's an overview. This is the moon as we see it from Earth. It is tidally locked, which means um, even though it rotates on its axis once a month, it goes around the Earth in that same length of time. And therefore, we constantly see one side. We see this one side because the mass distribution is such that we're looking at the heavier side of the moon based on these dark areas. These are mare, they're lava fields, and they'll play a key role in our story, as you'll find out. Here are the Apollo landing sites, Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And as you can see, they're mostly in the equatorial area, some in the mare, and then some in the interface between the mare, and even into more of the grayish areas. And so, what have we learned from this program? Well, more than 840 pounds of lunar samples were brought back to Earth that we have studied and we continue to study. And so the, some of the key things that we have found out are some of the top things that I want, to know, I want you to know today. So the first one is the rock evidence clearly indicates an origin of the moon that was consistent with a hypothesis called the giant impact hypothesis. So if you can imagine as uh, uh, our cloud begins to collapse, the area where the sun is at ends up with most of the material uh, and planets are starting to form as we are circling this massive area that will eventually become the sun. Uh, dust is accumulated into uh, and accreting uh, larger and larger bodies. And in and about the orbit of where the Earth is, a proto-Earth was forming, large enough to melt the material that it was accreting, heavier material was sinking to the, to the core, lighter material created the mantle and the crust. But it wasn't the only one in this area. This proto-planet we call proto-Earth was impacted by another uh, proto-planet we call Thea. And so within 100 million years after the solar system really got started and the sun started to shine using um, the nuclear energy in its interior, Thea slammed into the proto-Earth. The result was a massive explosion spewing much of Thea and a significant amount of the proto-Earth into space, which then began to reaccrete. And in fact, there's a region we call the Roche limit. It's about uh, 2.9 Earth radii away from the, the central body, the proto-Earth here. And all the material that was circling the Earth because it creates a debris disk fell on this uh, proto uh, uh, planet, creating what we know today as the Earth. Outside the Roche limit, that material started to accrete and created the moon. Now that means the moon, when it was created, actually was really close to the Earth, just outside the Roche limit. And so as you can see in the upper left corner, uh, the, the Earth is spinning very fast. One day on the Earth was five hours. The moon was just a few Earth radii away. And what happens between that formation process and today is tidal forces that are dissipated make that moon move away in its orbit. And so at 3.9 billion years ago, the moon was at 21 Earth radii away. And of course, today, the moon is at 60 Earth radii away. So the appearance of the moon in that early formation process must have been absolutely gigantic, a huge 
uh, object, more than 16 times the current size of our moon, dominating the skies. Well, this is uh, uh, coming from the early rock record that we have. Other things that we found out is that there was a period several hundred million years after the moon and the Earth formed uh, and became uh, the Earth-Moon system, huge impacts were occurring. Now, these are, are mega impacts, not enough to bust the bodies apart, but definitely enough to really change the environment on the crust of both the Earth and the Moon. So there's at least more than a dozen of these very large impacts that were hitting the moon. And what was happening in the interior is that magma was coming up from the upper mantle, lower crust, and pouring into these impact regions. And this was, this was what creates the Mari that we see today. Uh, the Mari is the darker areas. It is enriched in iron. It's enriched in more of the heavier uh, material that has to come from the interior of the moon to be able to uh, create these, uh, these, uh, these dark spots that we see on the moon on its shape. During that time period, the moon was also outgassing. Enormous amount of atmosphere was being created. In fact, we believe the atmosphere during this time period was perhaps 10 millibar, maybe as much as 12 or so millibar. Uh, uh, as a contrast, the atmospheric pressure on the surface of Mars is 6 millibar. So indeed, this was a significant atmosphere at the time. We also, teasing out from the rock record, realized that the moon generated a magnetic field. It had a magnetosphere just like the Earth did. And these two magnetic fields uh, intertwine and became coupled. And in fact, and you can see in this light blue region, evaporated atmosphere from that early Earth was coming up these field lines and entering the polar caps of the moon. Well, within about 600 million years or so, the magnetic field of the moon uh, 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 actually dissipates, and then the solar wind strips the atmosphere. And so from about 3.6 billion years to today, we see the moon largely as it was at that particular time after the stripping of the atmosphere away uh, from the moon. Now, what else we have found out from recent observations, and this is from the LADEE spacecraft, that was orbiting the moon, looking for any sort of tenuous outgassing that the moon does uh, due to volcanic activity and other things that are going on, even though the moon is, is cooling off and has a small body rapidly cooling off. And this is actually what stopped its magnetic field 3.6 billion years ago. But every once in a while, Laddie was observing these clouds of water and this is really spectacular because we were able to connect those clouds of water with the moon's passage through old cometary orbits. And this is what, of course, produces meteor showers. You know, we see them as shooting stars. They're the Leonids, the Geminoids, and you know, many others that, that periodically go by. And these these bursts of water indeed match uh, the, these uh, passages, and the micrometeors are hitting the surface of the moon, liberating water. And of course, the water will eventually move, not all of it, but some of it, to the polar areas, which are the cold areas on the moon. Now, these are cold traps. In fact, uh, here we see regions on the south pole of the moon which are in dark. This is a, a full month's worth of observation put together in one image right at the polar cap. Now Shackleton is, uh, is right at that uh, uh, south polar uh, rotational axis. And these regions that are outlined indeed are in permanent shadow. Now from our remote observations, we can lay on top of that 
a water signal. Now, we didn't know exactly if it was water or hydroxyl. So it could have been H2O or OH. But SOFIA, most recently in its observations, clearly demonstrates the moon has this water layer. And so consequently, we now believe that what's in these permanently shadowed regions and these blue blue areas that are uh, placed over the permanently shadowed uh, regions are indeed uh, what we believe is a significant amount of water. In fact, there may be several hundred million tons of water indeed in these permanently shadowed regions in the South Polar Cap. Now, this is an absolute game changer. This is what makes going back to the moon extremely important important for us because it now has a resource and a significant one that we can use. From a scientific point of view, we want to be able to go into these permanently shadowed regions. We want to be able to core into the, the base of these, uh, of these craters and get the stratigraphy of these water events over time. And in fact, we believe early on as right after the moon was formed and it was hit by comets and asteroids liberating water. We'll see the early uh, in, in, in indication of what those materials are. This outgassing of um, events that occurred uh, after the moon was formed in a time period we call the late heavy bombardment, uh, indeed producing the atmosphere. We think we'll see the lunar atmospheric volatiles and because of that magnetic connection with the Earth, we're going to see the Earth also embedded in these craters. So this means there's a significant amount of water. And even over the last 3.6 billion years, this water cycle we have found where micrometeors bombard the, the moon, releasing the subsurface water and eventually finding its way to the polar cap, at least a small percentage of it will. We will see, we believe, much of this stratigraphy. Now, as micrometeors, as it hits the moon, may mix this up a little bit, but the trends ought to be there. Well, what about this water? Water we can drink. H2O is water, whether it's on Earth or in the moon's permanently shadowed crater. It's water, all right? We can tease the water apart. We can breathe the oxygen. That's also quite critical, of course, being able to leverage a resource. We can tease the hydrogen and the oxygen apart and store it in a way that we can use it for rocket fuel. So this resource of water on the moon is a significant one and one that we plan to use in major ways 